So this year I decided to take on the challenge and, and do one of the more difficult bike races that are available for me here in Perth, Western Australia. And uh, this, is, this is called the, the Three Dams Challenge. And it is a challenge because not only it's a fairly long bike race, it's 134 kilometers, which is not quite 100 miles, but, but close to it. Uh, it involves a lot of climbing, uh, as you can see on the Strava map. In fact, it has three category four climbs, and all category four climbs is the lowest level climb that a professional cyclist would care about it is it is quite a bit of a challenge for uh for a age group athlete like me uh so apart from the training involved in in, in doing this bike race i also went to strava to analyze the bike route and try to come up with a plan for uh i'm actually attacking all these hills and you can see in strava they they offer the bike route for it on a map which you can move around or zoom and there's also an elevation plot here, uh, which you can sort of see where it is. It is a bit difficult to, to use because while you can find the instant position everywhere, basically, it doesn't really tell me how difficult the climbs are or where they start and where they end. Uh, now, at this point, you probably are wondering what any of this has to do with racket. Uh, my name is Alex Horshiny. I am a racket enthusiast and I am going to show you how to build an application that shows all this information and permits us to build on top of it to provide further insight on, on this bike route. In fact, uh, what we're going to build today is, uh, is something that looks like this. Um, it's going to show, it's going to be able to load the data that we export from Strava shows the map and elevation, everything is going to be interactive, uh, it's going to detect and highlight the climbs that are available on the route. Uh, again, uh, on mouse hover, hover, we're going to show individual information. And it's going to be quite a short application. It's actually under 150 lines of racket. So let's begin. The first thing we need to do is download the data from Strava. So I'm going to go back to the Strava website, uh, click on export GPX, uh, save it. It is now on my local computer. So I'll switch to uh, Racket and I will load up the file. So before we do that, I have a small racket program here, which just loads the required modules that we'll use in this demo uh, and sets up some plot defaults. But other than that, uh, it's not doing really anything else. Uh, so I'm going to hide the definitions window because we're not going to use it. And I'm, to, I'm going to load the data frame object containing the GPX route. And it is in uh, C. Download. Okay, so the data frame object, uh, can it's a generic object, it's not specific to the GPX route itself, it is a object that holds that, a table of data. Uh, and we can have a look at the summary of it using df describe, which tells us that uh, it's an object that there's, there's 1900 or so rows in there, uh, and it co contains uh, four columns, uh, latitude, longitude, represent the GPS coordinates, the track and uh, there's a DST. This is the distance. It, it measures the distance from the st start of the route uh, and altitude for for each of the points on the route. So uh, we can plot the data to have a look at it. And we're going to use lines. 
Um, so we're going to plot the attitude first, and we can say that we're going to select from the data frame and the destination and altitude. Uh, we're going to use dark green for the color and the line width. We're going to choose a thicker width so it's more visible in this video. Uh, three, and we're going to make the plot a bit wider as well. So this is the altitude plot uh, and you can sort of see that it is similar to the one on Strava. Uh, by default, plots in the interaction window can be manipulated. The default is to just zoom in on different regions of the plot, but we'll see later how we can change that behavior. We can also plot the actual route using the plot package. So this would look also like this. Also, we're going to use lines and I'm going to select from the data frame the longitude and latitude. Uh, let's use uh, coral for the color, also a thicker width. Now, this is very similar to the actual root itself, uh, but it is not entirely correct. This plots latitude, longitude, which are coordinates on a sphere onto a flat surface without considering any projection. Uh, so it kind of looks like that, but it is, it is not a correct projection. It gives an idea of the shape of the root, though. Uh, however, we can actually have a proper map uh, so to do that, we're going to say we want a new map snip, snip and the track is going to be the track in our GPX files. So we're going to select latitude, longitude, uh, or I'm going to choose a zoom level of 9 for the map. And this shows up a map. Uh, you can look, see the mag background and it also uses correct projection and also uh, as you would expect this is an interactive object so you can track, uh, you can drag with the mouse, you can zoom in in different areas and have a look at it. So uh, we've got quite a bit of behavior already uh, just by calling some commands in Racket uh, and of course using the interaction window is a good way to impress your friends, uh, but it's not very practical when, when you want to develop an application. So next thing we're going to actually uh, build a window that holds a plot and a map, and, and this will allow us to build a more useful application uh, for, for analyzing this data. I already prepared the initial program for doing all this, so I'm just going to open it. Um, it is still a simple program, just a few lines of code. Uh, we require the, the necessary libraries for doing this. Uh, we still read the data, this time in a program, not in the interactions window. Uh, we define a frame. This will be the window which will hold everything. A plot container, this is uh, a widget which is part of the frame which will hold the plots and the map. Uh, still the same plot, uh, but this time we, we give it a name so we can refer to it. Uh, still the same map, but again we give it a name and we simply add uh, the map and the plot as a vertical group into the container so they are stacked uh, one on top of each other and we say show the frame. So if I run the program uh, this will shortly open a window uh, with this, there it is. Uh, still the same things that we've seen uh, uh, in the interactions window objects are still interactive, plot can be zoomed in and out. Zooming in and out is not a particularly useful uh, for, 
functionality for this type of application. So what we'll do next is just add hover information. So we'll show the current altitude at the plot location as well as the current map position uh, where the mouse is over the plot. And to do this, uh, we will need to define a callback function. A callback function is invoked by the plot whenever the user uh, moves over the, the uh, plot with the mouse. So we can say define, it is simply a function, so we call it a plot callback. And the callback is invoked with four arguments. The snip, which is the plot itself, uh, the event, which is the mouse event that was triggered, uh, the, des the distance, the distance, which is the distance in plot coordinates where the mouse is, and altitude. Now, I used underscore here because uh, this is the altitude where the mouse is, not the altitude in the, in the data frame itself. Uh, so we're not going to use that value. Um, so inside uh, the function, uh, we're going to have return early, so we're going to use an escape continuation. Uh, So the first thing we need to do is validate the input events. Now, the plot callback will be invoked with all types of mouse events uh, to implement lots of functionality, uh, but we only care about, about mouse move events. Uh, and for that, there's a helper function called good hover, which receives the snip uh, destination altitude and event. The function will return true when uh, all the combination of parameters is valid for displaying uh, hover information uh, for it. So unless that's the case, uh, we're going to say send snip. So the terminology is overlay renderers for anything that we display on top of the plot. And we say that there will be none for the invalid mouse events, as well as send the map uh, the current location on the map is also not set. And we finally return in that case. Otherwise, uh, we now have a set of valid coordinates. So let's start with highlighting the current location on the map. We can find out the latitude, latitude, latitude longitude coordinates for the current distance where it is on the plot by using uh, a lookup function. In the data frame, we're looking uh, in the distance series and we want out the latitude and longitude. Uh, and the value we're looking is distance, uh, and we need to define, give it a name, let's say here. So we then say some, tell the map what the current location is, is here. Okay, so next thing we'll need to define some elements to show up on the plot. And uh, it's going to be easier if you give them a name. So define renders, and it's a list of elements. Uh, first one is a vertical rule, which is just a vertical line on the plot. Uh, and it's at the uh, distance, at the current distance. And we're going to use a short long dash style to make it stand out a bit. And another thing, we're going to add a label uh, with the current distance and altitude, uh, which is going to be a point pick renderer. And the location where that is added is at uh, where, the mouse is, where, the, where the mouse event is. So it's a DSD and altitude. So this is the location where the label will be displayed. And uh, there's another helper function which uh, allows us to build nice uh, labels, basically, just by specifying a set of parameters. So we're going to say 
the distance uh, and we're going to format the distance. Now the distance is in meters, uh, which is not particularly useful for a 130 kilometer bike route. So we're going to convert it to kilometers. Um, and add uh, some precision to it and we label it, let's say it's in kilometers. Um, okay, like this. We also want... Now, the altitude that is passed into the callback is not the actual altitude of the route itself, it's just where the mouse is. So we need to look up the altitude, so we're going to format it and we can use look up in the data frame again for the current for the distance series uh, we want to look for altitude and the value we're looking up is the distance precision is going to be let's add one digit of precision and we say that the value is in meters okay and finally uh, we can define uh, where exactly next to the point the, the label is defined, is, is, is displayed. Uh, we can say left, right, top, bottom, and so on. Uh, but we're going to use auto here, and the reason for that is that it will place the label such that it's always in the plot. If we're specifying left, for example, and the mouse is very close to the, to the left side of the plot, uh, the label might not be defined. So well, I'm not, not be shown on the plot. So we can now, uh, defining renders, we still need to tell the snip itself about these renders. So we say set overlay renders. So we simply set them. Uh, and that's it. And we now have this function, so we need to arrange for it to be invoked uh, uh, by the plot itself. So we can say send uh, set mouse event callback plot callback. Okay, so if we run the program again, click on run. If I've done everything correctly, Let's find out. So now, uh, instead of the zoom functionality, I can see the current location. So you can see the vertical rule where the mouse is, as well as the altitude and the distance from the start at the current location as a label. You can see how the label changes the side as I move towards the edges of the plot. This is what auto does, as well as the um, uh, current location on the map uh, where this is happening, where, where, where the current mouse is. So I can zoom it in uh, and again, it will show me that. So uh, we now have essentially the same level of functionality as the original Strava application had. Uh, next step is to detect the climbs uh, and highlight them on the map. Detecting the climb means just finding the sections of the route where the elevation goes up. However, this is complicated by the fact that uh, the data is not as smooth as, as we would like to show you what I mean by that. If we go back to the plot uh, that we created earlier, um, if I zoom in on a relatively smooth section of the route, you'll see that it seems to go up and down uh, quite a bit. And we would obviously have to filter out all those small changes because they're not really that relevant for, for detecting the, the big hills that are important in a bike race. Uh, so to simplify data, uh, we can use uh, a line simplification algorithm. Uh, to show you an example of that, uh, so we can extract Same attitude that I did, we just plotted earlier. So select uh, sorry, this is just a selection. Okay. 
so RDB simplify. There's a parameter epsilon which detect which defines how much how how aggressive the line simplification algorithm is. Now uh, uh, I determined it empirically that four seems to produce good results for this type of data, but you can play with other values as well. And uh, to show you what it looks like, um, we can plot the two uh, uh, the two lines on the two sets of data on top of each other. So we can plot the altitude. Uh, Using forest green line with the and on top of that we're going to play in the simplify data in red. I'm gonna make the plot a bit wider as well. <laughs> So as you can see, this plot looks mostly red, and the reason is that the, the simplified line looks almost identical as the original one. But if we zoom in, uh, we can see that the simplified line has nice big segments of relatively constant climb, as opposed to all the minor ups and downs that are used along the route. So we can use the simplified line uh, to, as an input to our climb detection algorithm. So back to our application, uh, we can add, uh, right after we load the file, we can extract the simplified data as well. So we can, uh, Simplifying the yes, select So we have that. Now um, we're going to have to uh, detect the climbs and I personally prefer defining structures for, for items that, that the program will manipulate rather than just simply using values, especially since things start to get a bit complex. So we're going to define a stru uh, climb structure, uh, which will have a start and end, which are the start and end distance of the climb inside the data frame. Um, we're going to have a distance member, which is the length of the climb. Uh, we're going to have the total elevation of the climb. And we're going to put a score in it. Um, the score uh, is, is, is something that, that it's used in cycling to try to measure uh, how difficult the climb is. And, and it's a value which, which takes into account the, the grade uh, of the climb as well as the distance. So it's, it, it is bigger the longer and, and, and the higher the grade um, it is. Uh, so we're going to run the algorithm on, on addition, uh, adjacent points in, uh, in the data set. Uh, so we're going to define, I'm just going to copy paste a uh, make climb function, uh, which essentially receives two data points um, and, and the contents is basically each data point is a vector of distance and altitude uh, from the data set. Um, and it is a climb if the end altitude is higher than, than the starting one, otherwise the descent. Uh, and if it is a climb, uh, we calculate the distance as, as the difference between the, the two distances, the elevation as the difference between the high and low. Uh, Grade, uh, which is simply the, the elevation over distance multiplied by 100 to make it a percentage. Uh, and the climb score, uh, this is the formula that is used for, for calculating climbs in, uh, evaluating climbs in cycling. So, uh, it's, it's the grade squared multiplied by the distance in kilometers. Uh, and finally, we just construct the climb structure, uh, here. Uh, we'll also need uh, two uh, helper functions. 
uh, we're going to identify climbs one by one between each two points of the data set. Uh, but of course, if we have two segments that both of them climb, even though different grades, uh, we're going to merge them. So we have a function which, which tells us whether two climbs uh, sit next to each other, uh, which is simply that the end of the climb, uh, climb A, is the same as the start of the climb B, the second climb. And we're going to have a join function which uh, will create a new climb, that is the, the merge of, of, of two, uh, two climbs. Uh, obviously, it starts at climb A, it ends at climb B. The distance is the sum of the two climbs. The actual elevation changes the sum to two elevations, and climb score is also additive. Uh, so with all this, uh, we can actually detect the climbs. Uh, so this is the climb detection code. Uh, it defines a list of climbs. Uh, and it's a it's a fold iteration, so it constructs the climb as it goes. I'm gonna get the result a bit later. So it goes over pairs of points in the simplified uh, uh, data, and uh, for each pair, we're gonna try to make a climb. Remember that uh, make climb returns false if this is a descent. Uh, so if a climb has been created, uh, we check if it's uh, if it's adjacent to the last climb that we created. If it is, uh, we're going to join them together. Uh, otherwise, we're just going to add a new climb to, to the result. Uh, and the last step, I return the value. Uh, we're going to filter out climbs that have a very low score. Uh, 11 seem to be uh, the climbs that that seem to me visually to be to be too low. Uh, one hundred is the score of or one hundred above is the score of a category four climb. So uh, you know we, we're gonna we're gonna show the climbs that are less than category fours as well. Uh, so to display this data, uh, we will need to create some plot renderers because. Everything that's that displayed on the plot is is essentially a uh, a renderer, and this can be done uh, using uh, what's called a rectangles renderers. So I'm going to show you this list. So basically, uh, we create the rectangles, uh, which is going to be uh, one item for each of the climbs in in in, in climbs. Um, so this goes over the list in climbs, uh, defines a start and end, uh, and creates an item. Uh, the trick here is is that we want, the, even though the rectangle draws a rectangle, uh, the horizontal location between start and end, and the vertical is between minus infinity and plus infinity, which would cover uh, the visible plot area. Um, and we use aquamarine as the color, and we also use a 0.5 alpha, so they are slightly transparent. And uh, we can add the lines, the, the, the climbs to the plot. So instead of just the lines for the elevation, we're going to show at the climbs. Um, so that's it. And, and that's about it. So if I run the program now, aha, uh -huh. I need to load this. So let's try again. So we've now got the climbs highlighted on the map, and you can see that it roughly corresponds to, to what visually we would detect as, as a climb. So this section is here, this would be one climb, there's another climb here, and so on. Uh, we can actually highlight the climbs on the map itself. Uh, this can be done uh, by adding the, 
we, we've created the maps in using a track. We can add additional tracks to to the um, to the map. And and the way we're going to do this, I'm just going to copy paste again uh, a bit of code. So tracks have a default color, which which we use for the initial one, uh, but we're going to use a different uh, color uh, for the highlighted uh, uh, tracks. Uh, basically, we're going to find a climb pan. Uh, we're going to say that uh, the pan used for the climbs group uh, is going to be a climb pan. Uh, and we also put the Z order, which is which is the order in which they are drawn as to 0 0.1. So they are drawn uh, in front of the main track. Uh, I also had a resize to fit to the map to actually make it zoom to the starting center. Uh, and then all we need to do is uh, essentially add a bit of code to iterate over the climbs again uh, we're going to extract from from the data frame uh, a latitude longitude section between the the start and end of the climb so uh, start and end of climbs are as uh, represented as distance uh, uh, but the data frame works with indexes so first we find out where the index of the climb start and climb end are and we just extract the track and then add another track to the map in the climbs group. Uh, so that's about it. And if I run the program again, this time we're going to have in blue the actual uh, sections that correspond to the climb being highlighted in blue so I can always see on the map uh, where the climbs actually are and what section. And finally, uh, we should probably add uh, a, a bit of information about uh, the climb itself as we hover onto the plot. Uh, so we're going to add the helper function uh, which will just uh, find the current climb based on a certain or, or a specified destination, uh, a distance, sorry, uh, in the data frame, uh, which again just goes over all the climbs. And if the distance is within start and end, and returns the actual climb. And then uh, for the hover badge, we're just going to extend it. Uh, so we're going to say append. Uh, we're just going to, again, copy paste. So we're going to try to find if there's a climb at the current location. Uh, and if there is, then we're going to display the score length and ascent of the climb itself. Um, otherwise, we're just going to return now. So not, not going to display anything. Um, so that's the update. And if we now run the program, we should have, so let's see if this works. So here there's no climb, so it just displays altitude and distance. And if we go inside the climb, it now uh, tells me that we are within a uh, climb that has 22 kilometers. Uh, it climbs 260 meters and its score is 166. Uh, this one is just a short one and a half kilometer climb. I happen to know that right here at the end, there's a climb that's just 1.4 kilometer long, but its score is 127. This is actually quite a steep climb, uh, as well as also a 109 climb with a score 109. Uh, remember that that's a category one climb. So uh, there you have it. Uh, it's uh, the whole program is about uh, 128 lines of code and it has quite a few features including i suppose you know some data analysis with, with detecting climbs we could continue to add new features to this application but we have to stop somewhere so we'll stop here for my part i will now start taking a closer look at all those hills that I will have to climb as part of this race and start preparing for it. So wish me luck.